Just like every one of you, I have at times wondered, does sound help plants grow? Now we've all heard that talking to your plants helps them grow, but when you're talking to your plants, you're essentially shooting carbon dioxide at them. I theorize that talking creepily and closely and erotically to your plants will help them grow even more, which is scientific evidence that all plants want to f humans. This is plastic, by the way. What about just plain old carbon dioxide list sound? Let's find out. Yes. No. Evidence. Pseudoscience. Well, we got ourselves an excuse to conduct a good old scientific experiment. And I have seriously, painstakingly conducted an experiment over the last two months that quite convincingly suggests that specific sounds can increase plant growth and biomass. And it technically would not be clickbait if the title and thumbnail of this video was, I have discovered sonic fertilizer. But hold on, there are a lot of asterisks that I need to hand out. What type of plant, what type of soil, what type of speaker, what type of setting, and that is more or less the point of this video. Now I am of course going to show you a bunch of cool plant stuff, and in my opinion it is really awesome, but while I'm showing it to you, I'm also going to be talking to you about what science is, and we're gonna be addressing the big gigantic elephant in the science room, the repeatability crisis. The fact that only one third of modern scientific studies have results that can be repeated again, and what that means for uh, everything. Back in 1962, a study at Animal Eye University found that the growth rate of holy basil plants increased by 20% when consistently exposed to classical music, resulting in an increased 72% of biomass. They switched it up to some Indian ragas and that yielded similar results. They tried even more experiments with string instruments and harmoniums and rena music, and eventually reached the conclusion that the violin was the most effective instrument for plant growth. Not long after that, in Canada, another researcher managed to replicate this with with wheat fields by playing Bach's violin sonata. And then things got a little, you know, kooky. In the early 1970s, a musician and author by the name of Dorothy Ritalik decided to run some experiments of her own. I won't go into all of the details, but she arranged some inadequately defined plant chambers, put a speaker inside of them, and played different types of music for the plants, and the results were astonishing. It turns out that the plants really liked listening to classical music and Indian ragas, and not only grew faster, but grew towards the speaker playing the music. However, the plants hated and grew away from the speaker when abrasive music such as Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix was played. In fact, some of them died when being exposed to that stuff. And the plants didn't seem to like discordant classical music or single tones either. Wow. Dorothy wrote a now somewhat infamous book called The Sound of Music and Plants that showed off her findings and was widely published in 1973. My interpretation of the book was not that Dorothy was interested in increasing plant yield as much as she was interested in attempting to prove that there was a positive music and a negative music. But not only were her results not reproducible, but her methodology and even theory was pretty unclear. She was also religious and tried to staple her results to higher conclusions about New Age beliefs such as ESP and astrology. But what I personally found more problematic was the anthropomorphization, which I think is the longest word I've ever said on this channel. But to anthropomorphize something is to project human attributes to non-human things. Lucy loves being on camera. Hers knows that all the people watch and think she's so cute. Plants don't have feelings or emotions, much less do they enjoy or dislike particular genres of music. Naturally, that didn't stop the book from being treated as solid evidence by newspapers and writers across the world, and you can still see citations to her experiment on the internet today. But it did piss off a lot of scientists, and it became a bit of a de facto example of what one should be observant for if they intend to research effectively. So why does scientific method exist? A common answer is to find out how the world around Around us works, or create a workflow to find truth. But a much, much more accurate answer is that scientific method was created to reduce human bias. If you put your life savings into developing a speaker device that you believe will one day help plants grow, you'll naturally be more receptive to information supporting the idea that sound helps plants grow. Or maybe you had a hippie ex-girlfriend that used to wake up at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning and 
play stupid sounding music really loud for her plants. If that's the case, then chances are that you'll probably be more receptive to information showing that sound has no effect on plants. And what we need to do is wedge right between those two biases in a way that is only fueled by our raw curiosity. And with that mindset, there are no disappointing outcomes. The results of proper scientific method can only reward you, and any criticism of your theories or experiments can only enlighten you. All right, so before we do anything with sound, we need to create a control group. We're growing wheatgrass and chia in a completely isolated hydroponic chamber with 22 hours of bright light at 6,000 Kelvin, keeping us at a consistent, constant 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The water will be constantly pumped and circulated in each hydroponic chamber to prevent any buildup of minerals or fungus in any specific areas. And there will be no fertilizer in the water. We're basically converting electricity into grass for 12 days per trial. One thing that I like to do is dig a deep pedantic rabbit hole in my head that keeps asking more and more questions. For example, where's the water coming from, Ben? Fine. I'll filter and boil the water. Where will you be storing the water, Ben? Fine, I'll put it in airtight metal containers. Did you make sure the seeds were all the same size, Ben? Fine, I'll weigh them. Did you make sure the super sensitive scale is calibrated? Fine, I guess I'll test it by weighing density verified pieces of metal. This gets very time consuming and expensive, but not nearly as time consuming and as expensive as running the entire experiment over again to rule this type of thing out. And then in this control group, we're gonna be testing four different configurations for two different plants dry seeds, seeds pre-soaked for 24 hours, then dry seed and pre-soaked seeds under a little greenhouse container. So eight total configurations and the winner gets to be the configuration that gets to graduate to the sound experiment. Semantics and painfully annoying details are everything. A good example. Is there sound in outer space? The answer to this question is almost always a resounding no, because space is a vacuum and pressure waves cannot exist in a vacuum, right? No, actually, it doesn't really work like that. The Earth's gravity is what keeps our atmosphere glued to the planet, and it gradually diminishes the farther you get from the center of the Earth. So halfway between the Earth and the moon, you still will have a little bit of Earth's atmosphere. I did a whole fucking video on this that nobody watched. Okay, so to figure out if there's sound in space, we need to define what space means. Where does the Earth end and space begin? Fortunately, Theodore von Karman calculated the theoretical limit for airplane flight at 52.1 miles above Earth, and the FAI and almost everybody else called that the Karman line, aka the border where outer space begins. Then Noah was like, actually, the Carmen line is 62 miles above sea level. And then the FAI was like, you know what? We changed our mind. It's 100 kilometers. And then the US Air Force said, nope, it's 50 miles above sea level. And then NASA was like, nah, 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 guys, it's 72 miles. And then Theodore von Karman himself said, you know what? I was wrong. It's actually really stupid to make a binary line between Earth and space. These days, the Carmen line is debated and redefined every time another billionaire builds a giant cock and shoots himself into the sky. But the reason I cannot tell you if you could hear sound in space or not is because it's a deeply flawed question. More on that in a second. Okay, the chia seeds just kind of sucked in general. The greenhouse lids didn't seem to do much other than physically hold the wheatgrass back, and the dry seeds performed about 30% better than the pre-soaked seeds, so that's our baseline. Now we'll put in new filtered and boiled water, new perfectly weighed seeds, new sponges, and redo the entire experiment. But this time with a 4000 hertz zero degree phase sine wave coming from two of these III monitors, which are actually pretty loud and accurate. The sine wave itself will be generated by a tone generator and will be playing for 24 hours a day for 12 days. One row of plants will be directly in the 72 decibel field of audio, and the other row will be outside of the direct field, punching in around 64 decibels, each with their own circulated water. And the reason I chose 4000 Hertz is after doing a lot of study reading, it seems like plants from the camelinid clade tend to benefit from pressure waves around that frequency. Okay, see you in 12 days. Technically, it is not cold outside right now. It's just that there's not enough thermal energy being transferred from one system to another system. Or even more accurately, the atoms around here are just not moving fast enough. This would be an incredibly annoying way to communicate, but the overall purpose of this video is to tell you, and hopefully demonstrate to you a little bit at least, that there is no such thing as a definite truth or a definite answer or a binary. Every single thing in science, and as far as we know in reality, exists on a spectrum somewhere between highly improbable and highly probable. 
So that's obviously why so many research papers tend to use math instead of a simplified conversational language when getting into the specifics of a theory or an experiment. If A is greater than B, then A plus three will be greater than B plus three. And for your theory to be true, then every single formula that you throw at the original will verify the theory. And that's what makes it true. But in 1931, a hipster by the name of Kurt Gödel published his now infamous incompleteness theorems, which are not easy to read or digest. I own a few books that are published for the sole purpose of helping one digest Gödel's papers, and you need to read books on formal logic theory to help you digest those. But in a very tiny, compressed nutshell, what Gödel's incompleteness theorem tells us is that the only true thing about mathematics is that there is no such thing as true. Every theory that is built on even the most basic mathematical formula or arithmetic is incomplete. And as far as we know, it always will be. Does this mean that mathematics is broken or unreliable? No. It just means that every single thing that we observe or theorize exists on a spectrum between probable and improbable. Okay, so the row of grass that was in the indirect field of sound grew a little bit better with the 4000 hertz tone than without. The direct row of wheat grass, as in the ones directly in a loud ass sound field, grew over two inches more and had a 28% increase in biomass. This was honestly surprising to me. I did not expect anything that significant out of this. Okay, but what does this mean? Why is it happening and how is it happening? I can think of three theories. Number one, something Something about this particular frequency signals the wheatgrass that conditions are favorable for survival with increased biomass. I am not a biologist, so I'm not going to be the one to figure this one out. Number two, it could be possible that the acoustic pressure increases the efficiency of photosynthesis by stimulating cellular activity in the plant itself. Number three, that frequency of pressure waves could be assisting the plant in carrying its own weight, which might trigger it to grow a little bit more. That sounds silly, but you're talking to somebody who shares a patent in acoustic levitation. So I admit that's improbable, but I would really like to rule that out. Okay, this is going to take a bit longer than expected. Let's move the chamber to a safer place with some backup power and then try to tackle number three first. We need to find a probable average resonant frequency of the blades of wheatgrass and the ideal phase between the two monitors. Then new water, new sponges, new seeds, do the whole thing over for another 12 days. I've made a much more serious video that talks about this quite a bit, but there's a major war on truth and objectivity happening right now, and one of the weapons that's used in this war is intentionally misrepresenting the replication or reproducibility crisis as a way to discredit the effectiveness of research and scientific method. That way, truth becomes more malleable, and pesky things like being completely f***ing wrong don't get in the way of your personal objectives. You've probably seen the headlines. The majority of modern research studies and experiments happening in fields like chemistry, biology, medicine, and earth sciences have not or cannot be reproduced. And of course, you've heard about fields like environmental safety and climate change and the sociological effects of poverty being really shaky, unreliable fields of science. And when you hear this stuff without understanding the purpose of scientific method, it sounds like science or our compass for finding truth is fractured and inaccurate, but that's horseshit. Now, if you can't tell, I am pretty psychotically serious about my coffee. Now let's say that I conducted a study where I put this particular bean and roast and brew on a thousand people's wounds or abrasions or burns and it halved the recovery time or I guess made the healing time twice as fast. And let's say that it reduced infection over the baseline by 80%. And then somebody in Japan attempts to replicate my study and gets either slightly or drastically different results. That doesn't make my study any less true or useful. Scientific theories are not opinions. They are designed to be falsifiable. That lack of reproducibility actually adds a new layer onto my research and could help figure out what exactly is going on. And that precision could be useful in improving the healing or disinfection rates, or I guess just reducing the amount of people that would have to have my coffee rubbed in their wounds. The replication crisis is more about researchers not being funded to reproduce their own or others' studies. And some of that is probably because of capitalism. A fracking company is not going to be interested in spending money on a do-over for a published study of the safety of a new chemical if the first study yielded favorable results for them. And someone like myself or universities or even governments don't have enough money or resources to challenge them all, thus creating an overall 
overall bias over time. Do you want to know what the battle cry of a really poor or weak scientific argument is? Attacking the reputation of a researcher or a scientist or attempting to remove them of that classifier. Bill Nye is a good example of somebody who's a punching bag for people who have these types of arguments. And I don't care if Bill Nye is a Baptist preacher or a resounding esteemed intellect or if he's smoking crack in a freight train boxcar. Ideally, there shouldn't be a such thing as a person being scientifically credible or not, because you shouldn't have to feel compelled to take a leap of faith. Either the data is useful to you or it isn't. And for example, if you think that the research in this video is flawed, then by all means, write down a formalized proposal why or conduct your own experiment. I very, very much want to find out why and how sound effects plants more than I want to be right. Okay, 12 days later, we have some wheatgrass and uh, frankly, I'm amazed that these monitors could blast these loud nonstop tones endlessly for over a month without a hiccup. I was actually a little bit worried that I would be sacrificing them. Anyway, oh my God, Eureka, it didn't improve growth over the 4,000 Hertz test, but it did improve over not having any sound at all. So that makes my pressure waves helping the biomass gravity theory fall a bit flat. So now we should give my second theory some love get some methylene blue, which binds to nucleic acids and allows us to view cellular structures a whole lot easier. Then you have to put the right amount of immersion oil with a high refractive index on top of the slide to focus the lens. Anyway, this is a pretty dodgy way of trying to figure out the cellular resonant frequency of wheatgrass, but it's the best one that I could come up with. So unfortunately, when you zoom in this much with this level of dye, things are dark enough to where you have long exposures, so you can't really see things like vibration. So using my two eyes, I was able to observe a little bit more activity around 43 hertz. If you haven't figured it out from the nature of this video yet, there's not going to be any sort of conclusive study by the end of this video. This is probably going to go on for another year. I sometimes do lectures, workshops, or Q&As at colleges or universities, typically for music and production, but sometimes for economics and science. And every time that there's an open forum with the students, I'm asked the dreaded, awkward question. Where did you go to school? I was what you would call a troubled youth, and among those troubles was an arrest for marijuana and illegal weapon possession. And due to the Higher Education Act at the time, that disqualified me from any and all federal student loans. Since I came from a low-income family, that meant no college for me. So my answer to that question is, I dropped out of high school. But this isn't a sob story or something. I'm actually very grateful that things turned out the way that they did in my personal timeline, but it is considerably more difficult to get a paper published without the help of an institution. And in most of the applications, you're asked for your education credentials. And since a lot of the people deciding what gets published are usually still paying off their student loans, they tend to be biased. Many educational institutions refer to independent researchers as sit scientists or citizen scientists. And it's not like institutional science doesn't contain a heavy helping of poorly conducted studies and bias. There's tons of that, but that's okay because a good scientist is capable of interpreting that themselves. But I frequently get paid for private scientific research. So all of this doesn't really personally affect or even bother me all that much. It's just that the bummer is that the only thing that institutional classism prevents independent scientists from doing is contributing information and data to others along those formalized channels. It seems to me that it's a net loss for education and technology and probably a much larger threat to science than the replication crisis. The good news is that I am far from the only person talking about this and definitely not the loudest or most respected or educated person talking about this. And I feel like in the last 20 years, I've watched the profit-driven institutional wall of research publishing companies start to fall down. Anyway, what's up with you? Do you know what's like unfathomably cool to me? This channel, as I'm sure you've heard me say, operates as a nonprofit organization, but the bulk of the expenses actually pay for scientific research that aren't tethered to any sort of private industry or institution. And of course, if you want to be part of that community and have access to a whole bunch of released and unreleased music and random notes about videos I'm working on, and more importantly, if you want to be part of a really healthy, inspiring Discord community that has monthly songwriting challenges called Sim Selections, then my Patreon is for you, and you can join for as little as $1. Thanks for watching. Keep creating. Bye.